Now I'm really excited to uh, bring out Hugo Barra. And before he, before he leaps out here, I just want to say, some of you kn know that Hugo uh, was a uh, very, very important member of the Android team at Google. Uh, if, if those of you who have Android devices uh, actually owe uh, your enjoyment of that device to a considerable extent to Hugo. But now he's doing something that, if this is possible, is actually more exciting, I think, which is that he is uh, uh, taking a Chinese design, Chinese engineered, Chinese branded, and by the way, really good uh, smartphone, uh, and, and his job is to bring it uh, beyond, beyond the borders of China and really enter the global uh, smartphone market in, in a big way. So Hugo Barra of Xiaomi. Did I say anything wrong there? Uh, no. Absolutely. I gave you credit for Android. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All of Android. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll probably get calls from Andy and Sundar, but what the heck. Um, so, uh, you know this, but uh, I, I recently went uh, to China and uh, tested a Xiaomi phone. I interviewed uh, somebody else from Xiaomi at another event there and uh, walked around with the Mi Note, which yep, you can guy. now hold up. This is their a current flagship phone. Uh, and uh, walked around with it in China. Uh, suddenly, a whole bunch of additional websites appeared on it when I left China. <laughs> that was good. Uh, that's, not your, that's not your job uh, uh, or fault. Uh, and then I tested it here in the US, uh, primarily on Wi-Fi, because it's not yet built for the US. And um, I wrote a review, and I said, this, is, this thing is in the, in terms of its design and its functionality, it's in the class of an iPhone or a Galaxy. And I don't say that about many things. And this is from a company that most people here in the United States, certainly outside of the tech sector, and even people inside the tech sector, don't really know. So tell us about the company and the philosophy and how you do it. So we, um, we still call ourselves a startup, Walt. We are, we're about five years old. It was our birthday just uh, back in early April, uh, which we celebrated with a huge online sale, um, which speaks to the fact that we are an internet company. And we really like to define ourselves as an internet company uh, because we live on the internet. We do all of our marketing, if you will, all you know, our relationship with our users or fans, as they prefer to be called, is all via social media. Uh, we uh, also sell almost exclusively online. Uh, we're the third largest e-commerce uh, platform in China, and by far the largest pure play that only sells its own products. Um, you know, and uh, and everything we do. So you is can't online. go into a store and buy one of these. Uh, you, Even in China, you for the first time we ran an experiment uh, in our own service centers, which became sort of part-time retail stores for selling Mino Pro, which we just launched. Uh, but largely speaking, it is all done online. Okay. Um, and uh, and if we've introduced a bunch of new models for selling products online uh, because these devices are so popular. Uh, it, they will sell out at least in the beginning when we don't have a lot of supply. So we've introduced a flash sale model. Uh, which is a scheduled time. You've got to register ahead of time, and you've got to show up at you know precisely at noon, uh, you know, to buy that device that you want. Um, so that you know has really defined us in many ways uh, in China. And then what's really exciting about us, and I think what th further defines us as an internet company, is our community. Uh, is the approach that we take to building a community around our products. Uh, our forum, our user forum in China, has over 40 million members. Uh, more than half of the OS features that we built, the services that we add on top of uh, the operating system, are ideas that came on top from of the community on top of Android. Yeah. Yeah. These are ideas, at least half of them, didn't come from our product managers or our designers. They came from the community. Our engineers interact directly with users in the community. And just so they know, your uh, uh, layer on top of Android, which you, it's, I guess it's not really an operating system, but it, you kind of think of it that way, right? Yeah. It's called Mi UI. Mi right? UI, yeah. 
And um, can people write apps directly to MIUI yet or not? So, MIUI is true Android. You know, we don't have uh, you know, additional APIs or a particular developer SDK, anything like that. It's true Android. Uh, what we've done to Android is essentially what the founders of Android sort of visualized many, many years ago when they were thinking about what is it that they wanted to build. We've added uh, um, a completely different visual, uh, different interaction models. Uh, we've also sort of uniquely integrated a lot of services uh, into the operating system itself. You know, things that are very different from preloading an app, but rather integrating something deeply into the operating system. I gave an example earlier this morning to someone. Uh, if you call up McDonald's in China, McDonald's is the most popular food delivery service in China by you know, a, huge, a huge margin. Uh, and when you call McDonald's, you're essentially in your mind thinking about the menu and maybe you ask what's, you know, what are the me new meals uh, you know, that you can get, the deals and so on and so forth. Um, so what we did is every time you call McDonald's, uh, if you look at the screen of your, uh, of, of, your, of your Mi phone, when the call connects, you see a button that says view menu. You're on the phone. You press view menu and you'll see essentially what it would seem now, to walk not, into the store. Does McDonald's pay you for that? McDonald's has nothing to do with this. This is entirely, uh, this you is a built database we built ourselves. In fact, the database is maintained by the community. So we even have nothing to do with making sure that the data is, that data is up to date. What if users the data is not up to date or Users wrong? in the community take it upon themselves. Oh, it's, so it's the Wikipedia it model. So it's a Wikipedia And we all model. know all of our Wikipedia profiles are perfect, right? <laughs> Completely correct. So that's just one yeah, example of many. Um, of things that we've done on top of the OS. So it's hard to see this from the stage uh, as well as we might, but uh, when, if you get, if you have looked at it, or how many have seen this? Okay. A few. Well, the rest right. of you who haven't, uh, if you get a chance to see it, uh, I think you would, you would think, and if it didn't have any branding on it, and I'm not saying this because it's, I think it's a copy, but, because uh, it's not, but I mean, you would say, well, this must be made by Apple, or maybe if you're a Samsung fan, maybe it's made by them. It's really good, but let me ask you the really interesting question. What is the price of this in dollars? So the Snapdragon 801 version, uh, which is the one that you tested, uh, is $315 before taxes. No contract. No contract. And two SIM cards. Uh, dual SIM card, exactly. Dual four. Three hundred and fifteen dollars. That's right. U.S. equivalent. I think it was three hundred twenty-two dollars that when I reviewed it, <laughs> uh, just because of currency fluctuation. Yeah. Um, an iPhone six. Uh, what's the screen size again? Five point seven. So you right. want to compare it with? So the plus. iPhone six plus is seven hundred fifty dollars. The the gal similar Galaxy is three or four hundred dollars more. How do you do it for three hundred and fifteen dollars? So are uh, you making zero money on this? So it's a combination of a few things, Walt. And uh, you know, f first of all, um, we we sell direct, right? So we sell direct to to customers who come to our website. So there's no distribution margin, there's no retailer margin, and so on and so forth. And that's really important. Um, you know, secondly, we, we, do, uh, we are a very large OEM now. Um, in, in fact, for example, we are Qualcomm's third largest customer worldwide, right? So we do have amazing uh, relationships and business terms with our suppliers. Yeah, but so does um, Samsung, and they're $300 more. Sure. So. Um, well, two so more things that, that matter. I mean, you know. we, we, we don't make uh, a lot of money or any money at all in the beginning of the life cycle of a product. You know, we ah, would bring okay, a product into to market for and sell at a cost. But because the product stays in the market for so long, our average product stays in the market, meaning we continue to sell it for 18 months. Right? And as you very, very well know, you know, the cost curve of components is quite, you know, quite aggressively drops after the first six months. So if you think about it as, uh, as a product life cycle that lasts 18 months, we've had products that sold for over two years like Me2, for example, and Me3 we had to stop earlier because too many of the components we needed were no longer available. Uh, but when you think about the whole product life cycle, 18 months, and you think about how much money we make at any given point in time, of course, at most of it is towards the end. Very little or nothing in the beginning. 
right? And then it becomes actually quite healthy towards the end. And oftentimes what we do when we are quote unquote making too much money is we just drop the price. Right? So a product that is on the shelf for 18 months, meaning we're selling it for 18 months, sometimes we'll enjoy one, maybe even two price drops. Uh, right, but, the but by the time you make the bigger price drop toward the end, first of all, you're still making money after the price of course. drop. And you're about to bring out the next thing anyway. Yeah, but we do the price drop um, uh, because we want to remain aggressive, right, price-wise. We want to be able to sell something that at that point in time is such an amazing deal, right? A Snapdragon 801 product will be an incredibly hot, you know, highly desired product a year from now, without any doubt, even though there's going to be two processors ahead of it. Okay, so this has been uh, primarily aimed at the domestic Chinese market, but it does sell in a few other countries. Which countries? Uh, so MeNote for now only sells uh, in Mino. China, but all our Your yeah, other, our other uh, smartphones, uh, so we're now in eight markets. Uh, so we, we started in, China, in mainland China, uh, then we entered Taiwan and Hong Kong, you know, so greater China, if you will, Singapore, Malaysia, um, uh, Philippines, India, and Indonesia, uh, with India really being our largest market right now outside of, uh, of mainland China. And you yourself are living part-time in India, right? Yeah, I do. I, I, I call Bangalore my, my second home. It's the, the Silicon Valley of India, and I have a very good time there. Okay, so when are we going to get the opportunity to buy a Mi phone, either the Mi Note or your next one, whatever it is, here in the U.S. and, say, in Europe? When, when, when are you coming to yes. the developed West? We, uh, we don't have a set plan yet, meaning we, we haven't picked a date uh, or picked a particular smartphone to bring to the U.S. first. Uh, we're sort of dipping our toes. Uh, uh, some of you may have seen, we, we've, uh, we've, we, yesterday we announced that uh, me.com, or me store, is coming to the U.S. Uh, as well as U.K., Germany, and France the next week on Tuesday we're launching. And we're launching with four uh, best-selling accessory products. We're bringing um, our first wearable, which is Mi Band. We're bringing um, a few other products, for example, uh, uh, these headphones, which are extremely high-end, uh, uh, they're amazing uh, headphones. These, and these yet headphones. they only cost $11? Uh, well, these, are, these are $79, seventy nine ninety nine. But uh, if well, you look at... Well, even that, I mean, if, if they are extremely high-end, and I'm not endorsing your claim, Hugo, but... Yeah, so say, this is going to compete with, you know, devices, uh, uh, headsets that cost, uh, headphones that cost, you know, three, $300. Well, that more. was the point I was going to make. Exactly. Even $79, yeah. that's... And uh, we have other... Uh, uh, audio products that are coming at much lower prices, and we'll be announcing them soon. Uh, this is one of our best sellers. Uh, this is our uh, power, Mi Power Bank. Uh, this is $999. Uh, this is 5,000 milliamp hours. And it's this will work phones. with any phone that uses This will the... work with, with any phone. It's a two-amp uh, charging uh, phone, so it'll charge your you know, iPhone 6, or it'll charge your, uh, your top-end uh, Samsung at the highest charging rate, if you will, at the fastest charging rate. And what does it cost? And this is $999. Um, so this is... 999 <laughs> I just want to get it straight. <laughs> Not yet. $9.99. $9.99? That's right. Uh, and, and just again, just, I, I, I mean, how much do the, the, would something comparable to this usually cost? So if you go on you know, Amazon... It's not hundreds, but what would it normally cost? It'll, it'll cost usually 2 or 3x um, the, uh, you know, the price. And it's, uh, so that's one of two power banks that we're bringing. Um, uh, we're bringing Mi Band. Uh, which is our uh, fitness tracker and sleep tracker. That's uh, $15, $14.99. Uh, and it's a 60-day battery, by the way. So uh, you just have to make sure that you remember where you put the charger. That doesn't have a heart monitor, right? Uh, it does not have a heart monitor yet. Um, okay. And, and then... Um, and what is this? So this is, this is our selfie stick. Uh, so this is actually coming <laughs> pretty soon. Uh, we're going to have to You go, when I used here. to come visit you at Google, I never imagined you selling selfie sticks. I don't know. <laughs> so let's, why don't we take a selfie? Let's take a selfie. Because none of them have ever seen a selfie. I have to say, this is a pretty nice selfie stick. Yeah. You ready? Ready. One more, one more. All right. That's the first selfie stick picture taken on stage at our conference. Making history here, Walt. There we go. Um, so those are some of the products that we're bringing to start with. The selfie stick won't be available next week, but it is coming soon. Um, 
and that gets us started, right? These are products that do not require you know, US specific RF antenna design. They don't require you know, a special certification you know, or any kind of localization for that matter. They're just really good products uh, that are universal in nature and we, we, sh we think will sell really well here uh, because they have been selling pretty well in other markets. Uh, so we'll start there. Okay, and, and then? And then, uh, of course, when do we bring smartphones? Um, so like I said, we don't have a set date yet. We, uh, we are working on it. I mean, it's something we want to do. Have you said eventually. that before? You are working on it? It's uh, something you want to do? Yes, I've said it many times, okay. right? It's something, I mean, we, we haven't, we don't have active projects targeting the US yet for smartphones, but it's something that we're thinking about. Uh, and by the way, launching our store here is part of that process, right? Building a brand, creating awareness, uh, and so on and so forth. The US is such a competitive market. Yeah, talk to me. I was, that was going to be my next question. What is it that makes the U.S. difficult to enter? Uh, so the, and you know it. I mean, you, you uh, know it absolutely. intimately, personally. Yeah, so. the, the U.S. is a very different market from the other markets that we've been in, and, and there's quite a few reasons why. Uh, you know, first of all, the U.S. is not a price-sensitive market, uh, and on not only because of higher per capita income compared to markets, for example, like India or Indonesia uh, or Brazil, which will enter soon, but also because of the carrier subsidy model, right? Like the carrier subsidy model here kind of washes away a lot of these price advantages, for example, that we have. Not only that, but you also have to have all of these operator deals in place, and these are sort of complex things that take a lot of time to set up, right? So it takes a significant amount of energy. It you went through the, years, so the Nexus experience at, at Google, right? um, I, I did, and, and, and I've- Which was I've an attempt with... to do this without the carrier deals. <laughs> Uh, selling originally, I mean, it, it was, and, and in fact, that's the same model that Xiaomi has, right? Is to sell direct. Uh, I think, of course, we would sell direct uh, here in the U.S., but we also have to sell through operators, you know, for the carrier subsidy. I, well. I know you've been away for a little bit, but you know that the the carrier subsidy model is kind of finally slipping away here in the U.S. It's not gone. It's still probably even more than half, but it's compared to even two years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's evolving. Many, it's many evolving. more uh, uh, Americans are buying phones at full price. They're yeah. paying them over in monthly payments, right. but they're, usually there's not even any interest on those, right. and, they're, and they're paying, just buying the phone outright. It's their phone. They can, right. They're not tied into that carrier. They can take it to another carrier and put another SIM card in. Yeah, that's right. So, so I think the market is evolving, as you said. Um, there are many other challenges, marketing and, and brand development, for example. It, it takes, I mean, this, this, the signal to noise ratio uh, here in the U.S. is so low because there's so much excitement. There's so many new products coming out all the time. But, you know, you have to have a local office, a local team. You have to hire really good people to build that that energy. And you would have to, to build spend a lot of money on marketing. And we would try not to. We would try to do as much as we can via social media. Uh, but this might be a market where we have to break away from that model a little bit uh, because, uh, again, there's so much competition for consumer attention. Um, you know, we have to build an entire footprint for after-sales service, right? And the U.S. is an enormous country, right? So how do you make sure that if anyone has a problem with their phone, uh, they can just get it repaired? Typically, you would go to the carrier st uh, store, but even that requires a significant amount of back office integration. How to make sure that they have parts uh, so that they can get it repaired? How to make sure that their technicians are trained and so on and so forth? Then there's customer service, right? We wouldn't dare enter the U.S. without a spotless customer service experience. Uh, we have 8,000 people in our company Half of those are doing customer service related uh, roles. In China? Around the world, right? Okay. Whether that's you know, call center uh, or after sales and other things. But so, they're not, there's not like a, you have no physical like genius bars, that, you don't have that. We, we absolutely have a physical presence as well. We have uh, 450, uh, in, the, in China alone, we have 450 uh, places that you can go. Okay. Your device is repaired. So you could, why couldn't you just replicate that here for your customer service? Of course, that'll take years to do right, right? So right. you have to come up with a model that scales, right? So how, what do you do in the first month, right? What do you tell a customer who's in Detroit or who's in Miami or who's in LA? Where, like, where do they go? So you, you've, got, you've got to figure that out. So all of this takes a significant amount of time. They get on a plane, right? we, have, we have one of these, it's in uh, Detroit, go there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, countless, countless other things uh, that we really have to do to, to get ready. Uh, and I can't live in Bangalore and San Francisco at the same time, right? So we're, we'll do, we're doing these one at a time. Okay. All right. Uh, you make other things. 
Uh, you talked about some accessories, and you showed your flagship phone. Uh, but you make things that have nothing to do with phones. Can you talk about that? And uh, sure, I can. So we, um, I think the simplest way to put it is we, we only make three core products. Phones, TV, and our wireless router. And we can talk about these, but these are essentially our three core products that form our platform. You can think of them as our platform, right? Hardware uh, with services delivered on top of that. For everything else, mobile phone accessories, like the power bank I showed you, like the uh, you know, headphones and so on, um, uh, our wearables, uh, you know, we have Mi Band to start with, all of our smart home gadgets, and there's many exciting products Like your there. air purifiers? Air purifier, we have, a, we have a power strip. For those who don't know, stop me if I'm saying this wrong, I, when I was in China meeting with all these tech companies, which many of whom make phones or computers or something, they all somehow also make an air purifier. Because <laughs> it's a really big deal in China because of the air quality problems in several of the, I guess most of the big cities, for people to buy these air purifiers. Is that, was that a correct statement? Absolutely, and, and funny enough, the same problem exists uh, in India, although there is no uh, sort of uh, ecosystem of air purifier products, so we're gonna bring up air purifier there as well. Not that needed in San Francisco, I, I would say, uh, but we have an air purifier, we have a power strip. We've actually designed an amazingly beautiful power strip. Uh, it's like something that you're proud to like just leave it on your, on your you know, uh, uh, kitchen table if you want. Um, but the way we've, the approach that we've taken to building these products, I think, is, a, is one pretty unique thing. It, it would take a significant, significant amount of resources inside the company to build these products and to keep everything uh, moving in, in the highest possible speed. Um, so we said, we're not going to do that. We're going to stay focused on those three platform products alone, which I've mentioned. And then for everything else, we're going to create an ecosystem of startups, and we're going to have those guys build these products independently or semi-independently. So what we've done is we've, we've worked with founders in, in China, for the most part, uh, to help start these companies. Sometimes they've already been started there, there, they exist. Other times we'll actually put the founders together, ourselves. We'll back them as a major investor. And then we'll let them operate independently. They'll have their own office, they'll do their own hiring uh, and engineering and so on and so forth. We'll help them with product design because after all we want kind of a unified design language around all these products. We'll hook them up to our supply chain which is also very, very important. Sure. We'll introduce them to other investors, uh, and then we'll pick their best products, and we'll sell them on our website. We've so Under far, your brand? Uh, mostly under our brand, but not only under our brand. Okay. Uh, for so the that, ones that, that fitness band? Uh, so this is Mi Band, so this sells under our brand. But who right? made it? Uh, so this is made by a company called Huami, uh, which is a, it's a Chinese co a company. They actually also have offices in the US. Uh, and they're the only thing that they focus on are wearable devices, right? So they have uh, Mi Band. Uh, they've also designed uh, a weight scale, which we just call Mi Scale, Mi Weight Scale, um, which sort of, sort of goes hand in hand with the band, sort of the fitness, health, uh, right. tracking, value proposition. Um, so we sell about a million Mi Bands a month. A month. A month, right? So this is easily the most popular uh, a fitness tracker product in the world. Bigger than Fitbit, bigger than? I believe so. I haven't looked at Fitbit's numbers closely, but I believe so. I'm not 100% sure, but right. I believe so. Um, we've backed, so far, 39 companies like that, and most of which are and companies. And do your customers know when they buy it that it wasn't uh, designed and engineered and produced directly by Xiaomi? So we give everyone credit, right? So if you go to uh, our website right now and you look at our headphones, right? So um, these headphones, for example, they're, they're designed by a company that we backed called One More. So it'll say designed by One More. On the packaging itself, you'll see our logo and you'll see their logo. And do you, do you test these things for quality and all that sort of stuff? Absolutely. We would not put our brand or even sell a product uh, that we don't love. Right, so oftentimes we'll set pretty hard requirements on that. Are you the only kind of major company, I know you're young, but are you the only major company that has this model that you know of? That I know of, yes, especially operating at the scale that we do. Okay. Who are your, in China, which obviously is a huge market, I mean even if you only count the people 
with roughly the income of average Americans, it's a huge market. Um, who are your competitors in the smartphone business? Uh, the, the Chinese market is so insane. But who are your competitors? biggest competitors? Uh, I mean, the biggest companies, if you look at any IDC report, the biggest companies in China are basically us, Apple, Lenovo, Huawei. Um, those are probably the biggest ones. And then there's a bunch of other brands that are smaller. Uh, that, uh, so on that list, they, Apple's the only one that isn't a Chinese-based company? Uh, Samsung, sorry, is also on that list, yeah. Okay. Uh, Samsung is still doing quite well in China. Um, but the majority of the players, and in fact, the ones that are growing the fastest are all Chinese. In fact, most are companies that I guess people here haven't heard of. Do you think Apple has a short run, and Samsung, let's talk about them together. Uh, you know, they, Samsung actually has been under pressure in China lately and has, I think, slipped some. Apple, however, if I remember correctly, the last quarter they had like a 71% gain in China. I don't know. I mean, obviously, it may not be a huge base. I don't know. Do they have a runway? Do they have a? a do you think they have staying power in China? Um, I, I think they do in China and in every other market. Right? Uh, such amazing products, such high quality products, and you know, per capita income in China is is growing very quickly. Uh, the, the sort of the the upper middle class and high class in China is large. Right, so there is a, a market for, for premium products. I mean, that's, that's why we actually built the pro version of Mi Note, right? This is Mi Note Pro, uh, which, is a, which is the highest end device we ever made. What does that also. one cost? Uh, so this is $410, uh, uh -huh. which is the most expensive dev device that we've ever made right. with you know, insanely, insanely high specs. Still $340 less than the iPhone 6 Plus. Uh, yeah, and this is 64 gigs, so you'd compare it to the $850 uh, dollar right, version good. of so, iPhone 6 Plus. Yeah. Um, so, so there is there is definite room and growing in China for very high end products. Um, okay. So we're seeing that. Thank you, Hugo. Questions? Thank you, Walt. Yes. Hi, Walt. Hi, Stuart. Uh, can I have permission to ask two questions? I'd really like to do that if I could. If they're really short. Yeah, you know me. Um, yeah, that's why I said that. So, yeah. so Walt was <laughs> just asking you, Hugo about you know the comp competition in China. I just bought my first product from a Chinese company, which is a DJI Phantom 3. And DJI is considered to be the number one player in the drone business. And, they are. You know, has gotten in that position, which is the first time in my career that I've seen a Chinese company become the number one brand in a particular category. So I'd like your assessment of uh, what's the state of Chinese fi companies figuring out how to be global? since Xiaomi is obviously... And you have another well. question after that? I do. And so it's a shorter one and, and more specific. Uh, I, let's see. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, DJI is a fantastic example, and there's many other companies that you'll be running into even in the next few months uh, as you, as you, uh, you know, do your research. Um, but without a doubt, the China uh, tech ecosystem has really, really learned uh, how, to, uh, how to become an innovator. Of course, a lot of people um, have moved back from Silicon Valley to China because they've, you know, they're so excited about what's happening there that they want to be part of it. Uh, so there's many of these uh, uh, companies. Uh, I think a lot of them, uh, a lot of the examples that you probably will see now are hardware or hardware-software combinations. But I think uh, even purely on the software side, you're going to start to see a, a lot of energy coming, coming from China. And it's an incredibly fast-paced uh, uh, in fact, in some ways, even faster paced than Silicon Valley itself uh, ecosystem. It's fascinating to watch. All right, really uh, short. Uh, yeah, really short. So, uh, Shay Shay, um, uh, I don't know if you were involved with it when you were at Google, but Google did the Nexus as a direct model, and I want if you were, and I wonder whether you learned something from that experience that we you're talk, applying at Xiaomi. About that. Yeah, so in a nutshell, yes, we have a similar model, uh, but you know, Nexus, uh, Nexus has always been designed as a reference, uh, as a reference device, uh, sort of reference flagship. It's the platform on which Google launches the new version of the operating system. It's a very, very important part of how Google innovates. Um, you know, whereas we are focused on very, very large scale, uh, uh, sort of a very large scale business model. So it's, it's very different from a go-to-market perspective only because we're doing it such large scale, but it's a similar idea. Yes. Thanks, Walt. Um, <clears throat> Crawford Delpret with IDC. Hugo, glad to see that you're using our data. Um, qu question for you about the brand. When I travel through China, 
I see, well, one thing you didn't ask about was the passion for your founder in China and, and the, the celebrity status of your brand in China. When I go to Singapore, people are excited about your product, but it's not the same passion. Can you talk to, as you expand around the world, how do you build that passion for the brand that is, that is truly unique? I've never seen anything like it in China. Or is that not part of the plan as you, as you create this Xiaomi experience around the world? Um, so, so first of all, can I get a free report? <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> let's uh, talk offline. <laughs> uh, Singaporeans are just as passionate; they're just much more reserved. Uh, without <laughs> a doubt. Uh, and you know, I think the, the the best answer to this question is to recommend you go on our YouTube channel and watch our launch event in India. Uh, and I was there; I was on stage, and I think we topped. Uh, I'm talking like we Indians; we topped. Uh, the, the energy level that you'd seen in any China event. Um, so we have managed to bring that same passion, that same excitement for the brand, for being part of it, you know, for being right there uh, in the audience with, with the media and so on and so forth. We had, we had 2,000 people in the audience. This was in, in uh, Siri Auditorium in New Delhi, which was the same auditorium that Barack Obama used when he visited India for, for his uh, big event. It's the largest thing we could find. Uh, so it fits 2,000 people. We had a little bit more than 2,000. There were a bunch of people standing and sitting in the aisles. Um, 200 media, everybody else were fans. And you know, the house came down you know, every, every three or four minutes. Uh, I'd recommend you watching because it's really interesting to see uh, how quickly you know, people got excited about us there. Uh, huge support. I think the model works perfectly everywhere. Thanks. Steve. Yeah, as you uh, are looking ahead to moving into the U.S. and other Western countries, what do you do for the, uh, the code, the language? Is it, or do you go with Android? What form of Android to meet those markets? Uh, so we are Android through and through. Uh, that's all what, we do. What Android? I'm sorry? What Android? Uh, the latest version of Android, right? So. I hate, do you mean like the, Google, the, he, the Android with the full Google suite versus the right. open Android? I think that was the... What was sure, the okay. So, so we build on top of open Android, and then in every market outside of China, we ship um, GMS, as you call it, which is the full suite of Google, you know, Google services, all of the apps, you know, the search bar, and you know, the, the account system integrated, and all that stuff. That was when, when I had my test phone, and I was in China, none of that stuff was on there. I drove over to Hong Kong, boom. Yeah. It just all appeared on the phone. Yeah. That's the idea. Okay. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you, Walt. Cheers.